Hey guys, I'm James, a seasoned DevOps engineer. Today you're gonna to be joining me for a little bit of chaos engineering. I've already broken down my home lab and in its place, we're gonna be spinning up a Proxmox high availability cluster. Now there are many other videos out there and tutorials about how to set up Proxmox on one node. However, we're gonna be taking that a step further and clustering my old hardware into a new high availability cluster. In this video, we're gonna be talking about IP reservations. We're gonna be talking about Proxmox requirements, generating the USB media, and also some bio settings you might have missed, as well as the UI version of how to install and set up this cluster. Now let's jump into PFSense and we'll start configuring our IP reservations. So in order to get started on the DHCP settings, we're going to need to migrate our current entries over from the bare metal Kubernetes entries to the Proxmox entries that we wanna have for our host names. To do this, we're going to click on DHCP server settings. We're gonna to scroll to the bottom here and we're going to edit the current entries that we have here for our Kubernetes clusters. And then we're going to change them over to Proxmox 01. Now on my configuration, client ID, host name, and description are all going to be the same. Um, usually I've seen this practice amongst a couple other people that I've known. The only ones that I believe really matter are the client ID and the host name. Now, if you're going to also configure a new entry instead of migrating as you would be setting up new servers, you're just gonna click add and then enter in the IP address that you want for your home network. And then along with the MAC address and the configuration for the client ID, the host name and description. Now, following all of our configuration changes we've made to the DHCP server, we're going to scroll up to the top and hit apply. This should take a few seconds, but it should apply fairly quick. And then our host names are gonna be set and configured. Before we get started installing Proxmox, we'll need to first burn our ISO to a USB drive. There are a couple of small requirements I wanna go over for Proxmox before we actually do this though. Underneath the recommended hardware, you'll actually see that it requires fast and redundant storage for best results, use SSD disk. We're also gonna ask that you have a redundant NIC. Now for our version of the home lab, we're not gonna have these kind of things. Uh, we're actually going to be using some mini PCs which as you've seen on Serve the Home, he's done a whole series on these. They're actually fairly powerful and small machines that are great for home labbing. Because we're not using some of these redundant things, we're gonna be scrolling down here and looking at the minimum hardware, which usually is more accurate to home labs. We'll have one NIC, single failover, right? And then what'll happen is we'll just cluster these Proxmox nodes so that if one fails, we'll be able to migrate between them. Now there could be some drawbacks if you don't have a majority share still available if you lose one node. Proxmox uses a quorum based technique to provide a consistent state among all cluster nodes. A quorum is basically a minimum number of votes that a change has to get approval on before you're able to make a change in a distributed system. Meaning that if you're only using two nodes and one of those nodes go down, you no longer have a online majority share of the nodes as you've lost 50%. Now, here's where you would wanna have three nodes if you're creating a cluster. If you have a cluster of three nodes and you lose one of them, you'll still have two nodes that are still available, which make up a 66% majority of the voting shares that are available in your cluster. So now moving on, what we're gonna do is actually install Belina after we downloaded the ISO. Now, Belina Etcher actually allows us to create a beautiful USB drive with our ISO mounted on top of it. There are multiple other choices. I've just always gone with Belina because it's super lightweight and it's very easy to use. Once we've downloaded and installed Belina, we're going to open it up and then we're gonna select our target file that we want to flash onto our USB media. This will be the Proxmox ISO we downloaded earlier. And then following this, we're gonna select the target. This will be our USB drive that we have plugged into our computer. Once we hit flash, we're going to confirm that we want to erase all the disk on our USB drive. Now, because this is a fresh USB drive, we don't really have to worry about this, but if you're reusing a USB drive, you want to be aware that you may not want to erase all your data. One of the reasons I like using Belina Etcher is just because I'm able to validate and verify the media is mounted properly to the USB drive. When using older hardware or trying to spin something up, the last thing you want to deal with is a corrupted USB drive that can't install the media properly. You'd rather be troubleshooting something else if something else is wrong. So now that we have our USB media and we've upgraded our RAM on our hardware, we're going to actually step through the BIOS here. We want to make sure that all our RAM is detected and we want to double check that our power settings are configured properly for this VM. Now, because we're using a Proxmox agent, whenever there's a power outage, we wanna make sure that we have the appropriate AC recovery on. 
typically you can have the last power state. I typically like to leave it on powered on just in case that if I'm migrating it or something like that, it automatically powers on and I don't have to worry about booting it up the first time. We also want to make sure that we're stepping into the virtualization settings. This just allows us to make sure we can host virtual machines on this hardware itself. So once all these settings are configured, we're just going to hit apply and then exit out of the BIOS and we'll get started on the next steps. So now that we have our BIOS settings configured, we're going to boot into our USB media and we're going to select the graphical configuration for Proxmox. So now that we're in the Proxmox installation UI, we're going to read through the user acceptance agreement, make sure we understand that fully and just go ahead and click next. Now, because these are mini PCs, they only have one or two drive locations. Most of my nodes only have one drive location. So by default, we're just gonna select this one here and we're just gonna hit next. On the next screen, we're going to configure and select our country and along with our time zone and our keyboard layout. Once that's done, we're gonna hit next. On the following screen, we're gonna have a prompt for a password. This will be your root password for logging into the Proxmox instance once it's finished installing. Now there's no way to recover this. This is very important. Make sure you have a password that you remember or you store in LastPass or other password managers. Once you've entered your password and your email, you're gonna hit next. On the next screen, you'll have your network entries. Now this will be your host name that you configured in your firewall earlier, along with your DHCP server reservation. Now, if you configured this correctly, you will see the IP you've reserved in your firewall and you will just have to configure the host name that you've also configured with your DHCP settings. After confirming your IP and host name configurations, you're going to hit next and then you'll see a summary page. Once you've confirmed all the information is correct, you're going to hit the next button, which should begin the installation process. Once the installation is complete, we're going to try and hit the Proxmox UI through port 8006. Now, for our configuration, we're just going to try and hit proxmox01.home.local and port 8006. And then we should see the Proxmox UI. By default, the username will be root and then the password you configured during your installation process. Once you log in, you'll see a prompt for no valid subscription configuration has been set. This is something that you can remove using some workarounds. However, I usually just hit OK here to move past it. Now that we have our first Proxmox node up and running, I want to step into our repositories and change what repository we're using for updates. In the repository section, we're going to hit add, and then we're going to add our no subscription repository. This will allow us to pull updates for our Proxmox instance, along with any of our other nodes that we're going to add to our cluster in the future. Once we've configured our no subscription repository, we're going to go down this list, select the enterprise repository and hit disable. This will allow us to pull updates to our no subscription repository without having any conflicts on the enterprise repository. Now that we have our primary node configured for our repositories, we want to go to our data center level and select cluster, then create cluster. For our Proxmox cluster, all you need to do is configure a name. For me, I like PVE-cluster-01. This allows me to expand to other clusters in the future if I want to. Once this configuration is complete, we're going to click to view the join information here at the top. This join information will be base64 encoded and will contain the IP address of your Proxmox primary node. This is why it's so important to have a static or reserved IP configured while doing a Proxmox cluster. On our second node, we're going to go to the data center clusters and select join a cluster. We're going to paste in that join information into our Proxmox node. And then from there, you'll be able to see our peer address matches our primary node. Once we've entered in the root node password, we're gonna go ahead and click join. This should join both the nodes together into a cluster, and then it's just rinse and repeat for the next two nodes. Congratulations, you've survived the sprint. And hopefully have a Proxmox cluster online and ready to go. In our next video, we'll be diving a little bit deeper into the world of DevOps by using Ansible to spin up our VM templates. If you have any questions or specific topics you'd like us to cover in the future, drop a comment below. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.